Welcome to Measuring Success Right, the official podcast of the Marriott Student Review, a podcast for students by students, where we connect the leaders of tomorrow with the issues of today. Okay, guys, welcome back to the podcast Measuring Success Right. Today, we're excited to have Brian Grimm with us. He is the president and co-founder of Religious Freedom Business Foundations. Brian, we're excited to have you with us. Great to be with you. First off, I just wanted to ask you what you do and why you do it. So uh, what I do, I do lots of things. I'm a grandfather. I'm a husband. I'm a Catholic. uh, And then uh, my vocation in Catholic terms, that means my call or my calling in life, uh, is to um, be on mission all the time. And the way that I do that is by make, is working to make workplaces uh, faith-friendly so that uh, when you go to work, when you graduate, get a job, you can think that you can bring your whole self to work, uh, faith and all. So that's the current mission. It has global scope. So I work all over the world, and I've worked uh, all over the world. My kids were born in China in the 1980s, so you can date me uh, that way. <laughs> um, so, I, so again, I'm on mission. Wow, that's amazing. I feel like we can all, a, a lot, I can, and a lot of people can relate to that feeling of like, this is my mission in life. Like it's way more than just uh, working. It, like faith comes into everything. It's part of like everything you do. So I love that you said, I'm on a mission. (laughs) Well, yeah, sometimes, you know, like for Latter-day Saints, you know, you serve a mission and then you come home. So Mm -hmm. part of, uh, you know, part of our mission is not to think that way. You know, you you do a, you know, we're always on mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you're serving a formal mission, but we're always on mission uh, to love our neighbor, to love God and, and share that love with others. So when did you get involved with uh, this organization? Well, there's a big lead up to it. So in my past, my wife and I were Baptist missionaries and we worked in uh, Western China where uh, there's up to a million Uyghurs in what some call concentration camps uh, that the Chinese, uh, these are Muslims. And our kids all have Uyghur names, so things like that are, are special. And I had studied uh, sort of the history of both the spread of Christianity and also the spread of Islam. And both of those uh, faiths initially came into China through business people. And so the very first churches in China came across the Silk Road. These were, you know, merchants who were, you know, doing trade. And uh, they set up churches in this part of China where we were working, Western China. And the first Muslim mosque was actually set up in the, f- in the place where my first daughter was born um, back in 1983. And that was in Chuanzhou, China. This was on a different part of China, on the eastern coast, right across from Taiwan. And that port used to be like the biggest port in the world. Um, during the time of Marco Polo. It's where Marco Polo sailed back to Europe from. And uh, the first mosque was in that town because it was set up by Persian traders who were you know, plying their trades. So right from early on, I saw the connection between you know, faith and how it spreads. Mm-hmm. Um, those, weren't, those were people on mission, but not missionaries, right. uh, and, um, and business. And then after that, I had worked in the Soviet Union uh, in uh, Kazakhstan, which is uh, it was in the during the Soviet period, it was the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic, and during those years, uh, I brought a lot of business people to explore connections uh, again with this idea of you know business people can be on mission too, and uh, sort of in God's timing, uh, the Soviet Union dis- was dissolved in my office building uh, in. Uh, 1991. So uh, you might not know these names like Boris Yeltsin. He was the president of Russia at the time. They all converged because we had a big round table in our office building. And they signed away the the Soviet Union, left uh, Mikhail Gorbachev out. And the new president of Kazakhstan 
ask that week if I would turn their Communist Party training school into the first business school in what was then the former Soviet Union, Western Business School, which we did and it's still running today. So that president saw the connection between um, sort of innovation, we're having a new country, mm-hmm. and uh, business, but also faith, because I was <clears throat> leading a faith-based NGO and they knew it. Yeah. Um, so that that's what really, uh, that's one thing that led me to what I do. Then the uh, is just seeing all those connections. The other thing, later in life, I got a PhD in quantitative sociology, so I um, measure sort of religious dynamics, like an economist studies the economy. And in that, I saw the connection between religious freedom mm-hmm. and socioeconomic good. And I was working at the Pew Research Center um, at the time, a major think tank in Washington. And, you know, I started talking about this. Uh, my co-founder, Greg Clark, uh, who's on a, on a, a separate program with you, um, invited me to Brazil to start talking about this. And, and that God really used that as a call for me to um, start the foundation. And uh, so he and I got together and said, you know, there's a lot of connections between faith, freedom, and business, economy, religious freedom. Uh, so that's what the foundation that, that was a long answer to your question, but uh, you, you know, it, it there was it was a long road to setting it up, and all those all those experiences and previous um, previous work in this space really informed setting it up, and even what I do today. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like I've just got a glimpse into like an incredible journey. <laughs> like that is so amazing, just like all the little things you just mentioned. One thing I do want to ask you, I feel like religion and faith is so meaningful to each one of us. And it's, you keep it close to your heart, but when you want to share it, you can often feel quite fearful about that. Or even just like being true to yourself, like you said, like bringing your whole self to work. It's not necessarily about always sharing, but just like being true to yourself. How do you feel like you, do you still feel that fear and how have you overcome a lot of that fear? Well, I, th- I think w- one of the f- fears is when you have to have some sort of program or script or right. formula you have to share with somebody and get it all right, you know. <laughs> and, you know, <clears throat> you know, aside from uh, the Pope and President Nelson, you know, in our respective faiths, uh, you know, maybe the rest of us feel a little bit unsure, you know, at times and have doubts and um, and, uh, you know, wonder, and I mean, even prophets and popes have, uh, you know, I'm sure have their doubts and struggles. So um, the simplest thing is to do, put to practice uh, the greatest commandments. And, you know, of course, that's to love God and then to love our neighbor. And then in that, when you serve someone else, when you love them, you serve them. <clears throat> and that takes away uh, I mean, that comes straight out of faith. Mm-hmm. So when you want to put your faith to practice, um, it's not, that does, you know, maybe sometimes you might have a, uh, a theological discussion with someone, mm-hmm. but um, that's only meaningful if you already, you know, have a servant's heart. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you look at the life of, of, uh, of the Savior, that's what he spent his time doing. Mm-hmm. You know, he did teaching, but serving, uh, healing. Uh, ministering to people. Um, so that, I think, is every, anybody can do that. And, uh, w- you know, in the business school, at the Marriott Business School, uh, one of the concepts they have is servant leadership. And if you think about the best way to become a leader, uh, it's to serve others. So you go into a new workplace, you're all going to graduate, you know, before too long, find yourself in an entry-level position, uh, and, and maybe you have aspirations to work your way up. <clears throat> How does that work with faith, you know? And it works nicely because if you go in as a servant, that means you're helping others. And then all of a sudden, all those people you help start to look to you as the leader because you help them. Yeah. And and then you maybe they help you, but then that's uh, a perfect way to put faith to practice in the workplace. Mm-hmm. That's a you just answered my next question. <laughs> which is I, I, I'm, I'm yeah, mind you know. reading you. <laughs> just like as students, that is a perfect 
like advice going forward because in all aspects of our lives like we may not be a CEO or this huge leader in a company but we'll always be a leader in some sort like you mentioned at the beginning like you're a dad yeah like right there's right. all these roles we have and in all of these roles that will never fail us being a servant towards others yeah uh, another question I have is how do you obviously this podcast is about measuring success right and that's very individual but throughout this time um how do you feel like you have measured your success like have you had times uh, during being with the company that you maybe wanted a goal and it didn't come to fruition uh -huh. like how how do you measure that success well i i would say the the best measure of any success is whether you're aligned with God's will. So if, you know, if, if that's where you're at, um, then you're, you're being successful. And if you're off that path, then it's, it's a lack of success. And sometimes being on God's path uh, in, in my own life, um, you know, when I quit being Baptist, and became Catholic, you know, I was employed by the Baptist, I lost everything, mm -hmm. salary, insurance, college tuitions, uh, college scholarships for the kids, uh, all my network. Um, so sometimes God leads you to things that cost everything. Um, so if you measure success by whether that was a good career move, it's like my Baptist father-in-law said, not a not a very big career for a, a you know a married man in the Catholic Church that wants to be a minister you know and do ministry. Um, so by the world's eyes, that would have been a failure. Uh, but uh, from that day it was 1994. I've never once um, been anything but blessed by that decision. So you know that's how you can see success is is when you make decisions that lead uh, that leads you closer to God um, and that doesn't always mean it's more money or a step up the, the ladder uh, it can also mean a whole new direction where you begin again and uh, and so I think you have to think of success just by that one measure is is this leading to God and one one thing else uh, you probably heard of Jesuits. So Pope Francis is a is a Jesuit. So within the Catholic um, the Church, there's different orders like Jesuits and Dominicans and Franciscans. Uh, and Jesuit um, spiritual practice. So each of these has a, you know a unique spirituality and a unique vocation calling. Uh, and for Jesuits, they have these terms called consolation and desolation. And then every day you're always reflecting on the day before at, uh, to see what, where were my consolations and desolations. So consolation is anything where you feel like you're getting nearer to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and then a desolation is anything that f you're being pulled away. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe you get a, a job promotion and, you know, your salary goes up by, you know, $50,000, big promotion, uh, and you're working nonstop. You never see your family, mm -hmm. and pretty soon you're burning out. So what seemed like a, you in, the, in some terms, a consolation actually may be a desolation because it leads you in a path that's not right. Um, so I think that's part of, you know, that's related to the, the other question you asked about a measure of success is always being able to discern, uh, at least in, in the Jesuit Catholic terms, discern the spirits, you know, which ones are good and which ones are bad. I'm, I'm sure for Latter-day Saints you have different terminology, mm -hmm. uh, but you can probably catch it oh, pretty, pretty easily. No, oh, yeah. No, all amazing points. Like, I feel like my dad always says, like, good, better, best. Like, there's lots of good things in the world, but there's a few of the most important things that we can often get caught up in missing out on and like family is a huge one right I feel yeah. like in America like everyone not just in America but everyone is like looking for the next best thing and always trying to move up and sometimes I I feel like with COVID it has been a, a little bit of a blessing in disguise that like it's brought us back to the basics 
like being around the ones we love and uh, even with money you know sometimes we can get caught up in having more but that's not the true purpose you I did have a look on your website and when Christine came to talk to us and she talked about some of the businesses you've worked with like some huge ones like Apple Facebook um, how do you like I would kind of want I'm interested to know what you've done to help them implement um, this like movement well <clears throat> so first it's um, a movement of, of in your terms, the Holy Ghost, and I might say the Holy Spirit, <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a movement, um, a, a, a divine movement that's happening. Where in this period of history, uh, there's a lot of focus on diversity and inclusion. Even here at BYU, there's a big push on on uh, sort of that belonging. We have a, a new, I think, vice president of belonging, and and that's good. Uh, and it's important for people to feel like they belong because if you're at a workplace and you don't feel like you belong, how, how good is that? How motivated are you? And you know, how does that really set you free to do your best? So, you know, there's been a lot of focus on women, you know, in this diversity movement, women, race, uh, sexual orientation, LGBT, uh, um, disabilities, veterans, things like that. But there hasn't been a lot of focus on faith or religion as part of that, though it's part and parcel of diversity. Uh, there, but that's changed in recent years. And one of the things that we did two years ago uh, that's had just had significant impact is we invited all the Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 200, the top biggest companies in the United States, to come together at a conference this was when it was in person. It was right before COVID and, and divine providential timing. Um, come to the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And, you know, we had all these big companies come, uh, you know, from PayPal and Accenture and um, Intel. And, um, and then this year we had Google and Texas Instruments and you know, the list goes on and on. Dell Technologies. American Airlines, American Express, I can keep listing them, but I won't. <laughs> um, so that was the first time anybody had ever asked and invited all the companies that have faith employee resource groups uh, to come together for a conference. And, you know, these are groups within companies that employees lead, but the company sponsors. And, and they're set up for both supporting them, but supporting the business. And so bringing people faith together uh, to support one another, but with the mission of, you know, making a better product or better providing a better service. So when we pulled those together, it was the first time many of them had ever met each other, you know, from different companies. And it was a celebration. Uh, and then since then, we've been having monthly calls with uh, for Fortune 500 companies that uh, either want to uh, become more faith inclusive or the companies that are doing it well to share their experience. So that's really started to build a network uh, among companies, and um, that is growing. So it sort of multiplies itself. So as we started, uh, there were fewer companies today. You know, last year, PayPal added their Faith Employee Resource Group. PwC has now just started theirs, PricewaterhouseCooper. Walmart just started the, for the first time theirs last year. Uh, so the movement is uh, really picking up steam now. Wow, that is, so, that is so cool to hear. I feel like I've always, like, talked to my dad about this type of stuff and maybe it being a bit of a taboo thing to ever bring religion into like the workplace but yeah I love I absolutely love the <clears throat> what you guys are doing well the you know thinking of the UK where you're from uh, that when these big companies like Google they when they came to the decision to set up their interbelief network that has you know chapters for Muslims and Christians and Jews and Buddhists and they have an interfaith chapter where those that aren't represented by one of the large religions uh, can then come and, and meet and then think of starting their own chapters. When they said that, set that up, they had to make a decision. 
is this just an American thing or is this a global thing? And they said, no, this, they examined it. No, this is a global, this has global application. Mm -hmm. So they set up the Inner Belief Network. And at a recent event we had on anti-Semitism, uh, the head of Google's Inner Belief Network in the UK was one of our speakers. Uh, she's Jewish and, and she had a lot to say about what Google, now that they have this group, was doing to combat uh, the rise in anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. so, so as you think of this, uh, what's happening, it's not just an American thing. Yeah. Uh, it's spreading around the globe. And yesterday I gave a talk to 17,000 people in India. And in India, that's a small crowd, right? <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> it was on, uh, it was the seventh uh, parliament on uh, religion, science, and philosophy. And I shared some of the things we've talked about today. And it, you know, the, the, everybody was just so encouraged and they thought this is wonderful because their your faith is sort of oozing out of all the pores in, in India because people were very religious there. Um, and so they heard that as a sign of hope that, you know, we don't have to leave our faith outside the door when you come to work. And uh, in fact, that enriches and, and enlivens the workplace. So, uh, you know, it's something that works here and it works, works uh, it can work globally as well. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. 17,000 people is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's more than that here at BYU, so. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Uh, I do feel like sometimes, because like, like you said, a lot of us have served two year missions. We obviously don't just see that as like the end, but um, on the mission, your primary goal is to teach people about Jesus Christ, right? And so I think a lot of us do have this fear, like being truly ourselves uh, without in the workplace, um, because maybe we feel the inclination that we always have to share. But something I love that Christine said was like, you can be authentically yourself but like sharing you do not need to do like especially in the workplace like obviously there's maybe times where you are out and you do have a conversation but uh for the most part you there's no need to do that and you can just be authentically yourself um do you have any advice with that well uh, I've, I've already mentioned pope francis and he took his name when he became Pope Francis from St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis was the founder of the Franciscans. Uh, and St. Francis said, preach the gospel always mm -hmm. and use words if necessary. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thought that, you know, just living, living out the gospel um, is... Uh, is a form of sharing. Mm -hmm. I think in the workplace that proselytizing um, is generally not appropriate, uh, that that's, um, you know, you, you never want to share something against you know, somebody feeling coerced. So in the workplace, you know, if you want to share your faith with someone, it, you know, it always has to be that they're interested. You know, if they show an interest, you can share. Um, and if, if something's meaningful to you, you know, you can share it. But if you go into it with the objective that I'm going to, you know, proselytize you, you know, that's not a very you know, charitable, <laughs> you know, that's not, that, that can feel like you're just, you know, that other person's a, an object rather than a person. Mm -hmm. So I think that in, you know, in the workplace, not on, a, not on your typical mission, but in, you know, day-to-day -day life, uh, the people have to see that the gospel has meant something, mm -hmm. and um, and then there become opportunities to share that. But uh, I think there's also other complications. So if you're the boss, mm -hmm. and then you you know say, hey, I you want to come to church with me on Sunday mm -hmm. to somebody, then or you know I'm going to have a Bible study or whatever. You know if you give that message out to people who are you know, dependent on you for their job, you know, that you can, you have power over them, then that, that can be coercive. So there are certain do's and don'ts about faith in the workplace uh, that, uh, that, that need to be followed. And then when those are followed, it gives freedom to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. 
it's been amazing to hear from you and learn from you and just hear your best advice especially with um just success and in the fact that to you measuring success is doing the will of god i feel like that's exactly my answer as well i just feel like when you truly understand your purpose then that that is like your biggest like desire and so and like in feeling successful is there anything else that you would like to leave us with or any advice you'd give um to this cause uh, the last thing I'd just mention is to be curious, and that's probably one of the best ways to build relationships with people of other faiths and beliefs. Um, you come, you get into a new workplace, and there's a, you know, atheist who's anti-religious. Well, instead of feeling threatened by that, say, oh, what what led you to those beliefs? I'm interested. I'm curious. Without first saying I'm going to change your mind. <laughs> But being curious, because there's probably a lot of, you could say, good reasons that person came to that decision. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, not just a, about people who have no faith, but, you know, maybe I shared some things from my Catholic perspective that, mm -hmm. you know, were different and new and, and gave you some ideas that you might, you know, uh, might edify you and your own faith. Mm -hmm. So just being curious about other people's faiths mm -hmm. um, is, is really a good a good way because nobody, you know, people can get offended. Can get offended, like I mentioned, if you start pushing your faith on them. But people don't get offended if you say, "Oh, you know," they might mention, "Oh, I went to mass on Sunday." Oh, I've I've never been to mass. What what happens there? Mm -hmm. You know, um, instead of feeling like you know, here's a Muslim and they're fasting during Ramadan. You know, I, I don't know what that is. Yeah. But yeah. oh, I, I see you're fasting. Tell me about that. Yeah, totally. More listening, less talking. Yeah, and, and being curious. <laughs> and being curious, yeah. Yeah, sometimes we do fear asking people questions, but I think no one's ever, no one ever minds if you ask, like I never mind if someone asks me a question. Yeah. And sometimes we just like think that someone else would. And ask ask out of sincere interest, not mm -hmm. not to lead the conversation right. some other other way, but be curious, why, why do you do that? Why do you believe that? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, curiosity, you learn things and you can be edified uh, in that. Awesome. Well, thank you, Brian, for coming in today. And we are going to have a couple other people um, talking about religious freedom and how to bring it into the workplace as well. So make sure to tune in uh, for the next couple of weeks and enjoy. Everyone have a great day. This podcast is a project of the Marriott Student Review at Brigham Young University. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Marriott Student Review or online at MarriottStudentReview.org. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect official policy or position of Brigham Young University or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.